Why, hello there. Please, come in, bring yourself out of the bad weather, and join us for another rainy day reading. I'm here today with Jonathan Kaharl. How are you doing, sir? I ate four uh, grilled chicken legs, and I regret it. Excellent. I'm here with David O'Neill. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing good, thank you. Excellent. And we are here with the person who recommended today's manga, Stephanie Gatchell. How are you doing, ma'am? Good. A little tired, but still good. Just don't want to go to work tomorrow, is all. I don't think any of us want to be responsible adults. That's nah. why we, that's why we read comics. But nah. hey, we gotta do what we gotta do. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. We are going to. T- oh, yeah. I, my brain shut down for a moment. We're gonna talk about Niki Kahara Holograph, longest title probably we're gonna read at least the heart it took me like three days to learn how to pronounce that i still don't know how to pronounce it nijigahara holograph yeah exactly (laughs) i got it on my first try how did you not star crusaders ninja (laughs) galara i don't know how you couldn't have gotten on the first try i managed to get on the first try god such such fucking casuals I'm still finding it funny that Jonathan said Stardust Crusaders. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Uh, Close butterflies enough. Butterflies their stand. Close enough. Uh, the butterflies Which butterfly though? Stand like the, the the nineteen eighty song or the DDR song? Oh god damn it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is the second work for Asado Month. It is at, in it's very much like last time. It's very dark, very depressing, and all of us will have stuff to say on it. But, before we do that, I need to ask you guys, what have you been reading lately? So, Stephanie, you said you had something you were reading that you wanted to talk about, so I'll start with you. Go. I, I know for once I'm actually reading things. Um, <laughs> I've actually been trying to start to read more manga, um, particularly on the bus coming home from work, and sometimes if I like... I'm staying in the if I'm the one closing the office at the end of the day for the last hour. Um, so I managed to catch up with Tokyo Ghoul minus volumes four and five. But the the series I have been reading lately, I have been reading Paradise Kiss lately. Uh, it's one that has been sitting on my shelf for quite a while, and one I've been wanting to read for a while. Um, because if I remember correctly, the manga mangaka who wrote Paradise Kiss also wrote uh, the original manga for the series Nana, if I remember correctly. And I saw Nana all uh, years ago, and I heard about Paradise Kiss, and I've been wanting to s- I've been wanting to see the anime version. There is one that exists. Sadly, it's not licensed and it's out of print. Uh, so obviously, the manga is the next best thing. I'm actually on the second volume out of three. Um, and Paradise Kiss, if you don't know the story, it's about this girl, uh, and she's kind of living this boring life. She's stuck doing, like, all these exams constantly, and she's in, under a lot of pressure, typically, from her mother, uh, who wants her to succeed. But she stumbles across this place, um, called the Ulterior, Alter- and, uh, across four fashion for artsy fashion students and she's asked to become the model for this upcoming uh, final festival thing uh, for one of the students George um, who is essentially the one in charge of this whole project and he wants to create his own fashion label called Paracus and there's a lot of humor a lot of romance involved a lot of very mature things and, um, the, sh- the series does tend to break the fourth wall quite a bit. Um, I know there was one point where, um, two of the characters, they, they has the sex. But, um, and the start of the next chapter happens, and one of the characters is like, y- you-, you know, you're not supposed to do this kind of thing in shoujo manga, right? <laughs> they can't show that kind of thing. And then one of the, the other character who was involved... Um, in the sexual relations in the previous chapter, he's like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm gonna do what I want regardless. It does a good amount of fourth wall breaking, and so far it's been really good. And it kind of... It, this, the main heroine story can kind of probably hit home to some people, because if they haven't figured out... If they're kind of stuck in this rut, and they're trying to, like, 
to figure out what they want to do with their lives and not be pressured to do what they're told to or what society has wanted has been telling them to do for this long time. And I think so far cuz I'm I'm about halfway through. I think it's really really good story-wise and art style is nice and it's, everything about it so far I've been really enjoying it and I'm hoping I and hoping I may be able to finish it this week, but I gotta finish winter seasonal stuff first. <laughs> that's the priority first, of course. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's what I've been reading lately. Hmm? Cool. I'm sorry, I, I, I know I was supposed to say something there, but... Conifin, come on, that's in low class. <laughs> <laughs> Are you fucking serious right now? <laughs> Probably explain for the visual audience. Uh, gonna well, that's really why we have off. editing programs, and that's either I'm gonna cut this out or I'm gonna put the, up that picture. <laughs> Maybe even take a picture of this. All right. <sighs> okay. Are you are you done with your shit post? No, you're not done with your shit posting. <laughs> You'll never no, be done with your shit posting. But seriously, what the up. fuck, man? <laughs> just just oh, using the podcast as another mean, opportunity to shit post. Why'd you have to do that one with me, though? What did I do? <laughs> what did she do to deserve this? I don't know, <laughs> but apparently I did something. I am making art. Like a, good po- like a good shit posting between friends. Oh, god damn it. Alright, let's get back into it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stephanie. Alright, David, what have you been reading lately? Okay, I have two, like, kind of small things I want to talk about I've been reading. The first thing is not a manga, actually. It's an American comic, and I got the first print volume of the new Oni Press Invader Sim comic book. Because I was a huge Ooh. fan of the cartoon when I was a kid, and when I heard about I it, I was really I, interested. I didn't what? know this is a thing right now. Ah! Yeah, yeah, it's. Oh yeah. I love yeah, that yeah, show. It's... Yeah, yeah, I love the show too, and it's uh, made by. It's written, I'm pretty sure, entirely by the original creator, just like continuing the story and. It's exactly as fun as the original show was. He didn't nice. do the art, even though he used to be a graphic novel. He didn't do the art as a different person, but they still totally captured like the look and feel of the show. It's incredibly entertaining. It picks up on certain plot points that were kind of left untied when the show ended, and it's still com- completely hilarious. I'm really enjoying it. D- does Gur still sing the Doom song? <laughs> it's not like a straight adaptation, it's a continuation, so no, but... Damn it! <laughs> that'd be kind of hard to... That'd be hard to convey in a purely visual medium like comics. No, it's not. Just literally have little bubbles saying, do 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 No, but you need... Okay, listen. You would need the actual singing, though. I can be a mongoose. Can I be a mongoose? How about we just not have any sort of audio vi- audio cues in a fucking comic? Unless it's like a web comic where you can actually get away with audio. But I not like on paper. All along. I'm just singing okay. a doom song now. Yeah, I guess that is true. Like, you kind of. You do need. Yeah. It's not like. Like, visual cues are more made for comics than audio cues. Like. Like in the Ikigahara holograph, when when someone calls out to the woman and only one of her eyes looks toward it. Mm. Actually, that would have been that. I don't know. That's kind of a mixture of visual and audio. Mm. Kind of, yeah. I'm sorry. I just wanted to bring that up to depress everyone a little bit so we can get back on track. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, anyone who is a fan of the original show should definitely check it out because it's the se- it's the second season that we never got. So yeah, it's great. And the other thing is, I read the first two chapters of, like, I'm a big fan of the manga The Ancient Magic Bride, which is about this, like, young girl who gets taken in as the apprentice to this weird, inhuman creature who, like, becomes... A skeleton. Creature. Yeah, a weird skeleton creature. But I started reading this she other manga... She marries <laughs> But I started reading this other manga that has a kind of similar premise. It's called Totsukuni no Shoujo, which translates to foreign girl, basically, it seems, and it's... A sort of similar premise, it's much younger girl than in Magis Bride is taken in by this big beast-like creature who's like tall and wears a nice suit and is a, some sort of researcher but like isn't human. But it's a different feel than Magis Bride, it's almost storybook-like and it's a lot less about character and world building and more about 
kind of the mystery of what's going on and, and a big part of it is the art because the art is completely gorgeous it doesn't look like a normal manga again it almost looks like a storybook or something it the shit like it's gorgeous and for the least it's worth checking out for the art because it, it doesn't look like any other manga and it's really cool Sounds and neat. that's all i got cool thank you very much david should Jonathan, stop shit posting and start talking. <laughs> <laughs> so Before much shit posting. Your <laughs> Use your mouth to shit post. <laughs> oh god Before damn it! I get to... <laughs> Before I get to the main thing, I just want to say that Homestuck is finally ending. It will be ending on the thirteenth, and the sixth act of the series, which has been going on for four goddamn years finally ended as we're recording this with a giant 17 minute animation and it was glorious just a big explosion of references and uh and capping off a bunch of different character character arcs and just one big action pack 17 minute long thing with like a music track with all the composers from across the series it's fucking amazing i just god i love I'm just very happy right now. And I also wanted to bring the, that one up because they reference Shrek and then they also reference Undertale. Mm-hmm. So the most important works of fiction ever made. Of yeah, course. so internet, there, there's more reasons to get caught up on Homestuck now for you. <laughs> I, uh, I started reading Homestuck. I never made it out of the kid's bedroom because there's too much to click on. Oh, God, don't even bother with Act 1. What you want to do is... Linkara actually has a review of the first <laughs> Yeah, Linkara got paid to do a review of the first act, so he did it. It will catch you up to speed and then you can get into the interesting stuff from there. Yeah, because I thought the first act was really weird and slow too. I will to Yeah, it's I will just yeah, honestly mo- Oh sorry. <laughs> it's more in line with uh, the MS Paint Adventure stuff, which is basically just literal shit posting with no narrative and just mm. seeing what happens from what people suggest and then it gets a story from there mm. as someone who okay. has not read homestuck i will just be happy when people can stop talking about homestuck finally I don't know. I only, I only <laughs> too much shit it. I don't you really should uh love Keep it in mind because I think it's going to be influential to web comics uh, across the web for years to come. I mean, it's uh, incorporated gaming, music, animation, all sorts of other cool stuff you normally don't see back when it first came out. Uh, still, my point still stands. I'll be glad when people can stop talking about Homestuck. <laughs> I I got uh, I don't know how many conversations I was in the m- middle of my friends in college. Homestuck. 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 I don't care! <laughs> I don't care! Just please, yeah, you see, let me... You see, guys, do... guys, I want to make a prediction. This is going to be like with prison school. Stephanie's going to be like, I don't care, I don't care. She's actually going to read it. Oh, this is actually really good. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't Shut you guys up. tell me about this sooner? <laughs> Anyways, uh, if I can continue on to my uh, main of stuff. Of course. I haven't had a real chance to read a lot of manga or comics lately, other than Homestuck, obviously. And the only other thing I've really read, like a book or something, is a book on the 1921 riot in Tulsa, which is not a fun topic. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds sounds like a different kind of podcast if you wanted to talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so instead I'm just going to talk about a few games I've been uh, reviewing for Hardcore Gaming 101 because they actually do kind of fit into this because they're all adventure games and they're all very text-heavy and very narrative-heavy. So just uh, bear with me here. It's only three, but they're all interesting in some way. The first one, the one that I think you guys will probably might have a chance of actually knowing is Detective Grimmore. Uh, particularly not the original Flash version, but the 2014 game. It was made by uh, the Super Flash brothers, Thomas Tom Bean and Adam Dembian. And you may also know it because Aaron Hansen did a voice in it. Aaron Mark Zuckerberg Hansen. Yeah. It's a... Uh, I never know. heard of Detective Grimoire. That's that's surprising. We are like back in, 
like back in uh, 2006 and the, during the Flash gaming scene, this game was a big deal because it was basically a Phonics Right takeoff, but it was re- it was very sophisticated for a free Flash game. People were really impressed by it. So years later, they did a Kickstarter and made a, a full game with this gorgeous art style that sort of like reminds you of the Secret of Kells. Create this new lore and these and has all these uh voiced and complex characters and it was just it's really short but it's really really fun and I actually picked out the I thought Aaron Hansen was uh, doing the voice of this protester guy but he actually was doing two other voices and I didn't even realize it was him the entire game until the credits so I actually forgot he's a good voice actor because I'm so used to him just complaining about the Facebook movie and text message (laughs) The uh, second game I uh, have want to bring up is probably the strangest one. It's called Red Comrade Save the Galaxy by Buka Entertainment. And it's the strangest one because it is a Russian-made point-and-click game. And it's about communism fighting aliens. That's fun. Go on! <laughs> yeah, so you're uh, basically playing these uh, two uh, communist guys like in the early in like in the late 1910s and they're just trying to get their flag back from the capitalist pigs across the way except there's a, at the very beginning of the game it says hey there are aliens in this game and they're just like planning something but you don't actually see them till like the very last act and things just suddenly go completely batshit from there it is one of the weirdest games I've ever played it has like a bunch of different animation styles smashed into it it has a really uh, messed up sense of humor, but it's really fun and it has a great payoff. It's just something you have to pay out, play and be amazed it actually exists. I'm trying to think of the I'm trying to think of the best joke I can remember from it, but there's just like so many good ones. But like, there's a weird amount of references to 80 action movies like Terminator and stuff. I I actually kind of surprised me because I was expecting. I was not expecting that from a Russian-made game. And last was a game by Nexus Game Studios and published by Dalek Entertainment. They mainly do like, they mainly publish like weird fantasy adventure games. But this was a comedy adventure, and it was called Randall's Monday. And if you go on the Steam page and just look at any screenshot, it looks like the worst fucking thing. Like like some piece of go animate trash so I was surprised to find that I found it hilarious it's just a gigantic string of uh, references and uh, gags and it's like if one doesn't work another one's bound to work it's about this uh, alcoholic asshole with a who uh, is addicted to stealing things like he's clinically has this problem I forget the proper name and so one night he uh, steals a ring his friend was playing to propose to his girlfriend with and before he can get it back he has to pawn it to pay his rent and then uh, as the day ends it turns out his friend had committed suicide and so he goes home to sleep off and try to understand all this and then it's Monday again and in the and you're just basically living through a loop of never-ending Mondays and every change you make to the world slightly affects what's going to happen the next Monday. It's a really fun game. It's very it has a lot of great puzzles, and it's way bigger than I was expecting, and the last uh, level of the game is fantastic. It basically just the entire world's engulfed in hell, and you have to, like... Yeah, get food for the four horsemen of the apocalypse and they only want human flesh. It's just fucking ridiculous by that point. So, so in other words, it does, like, because how you're describing it, I thought it was going to apply to Groundhog Day rules, but it's not that? It's sort of, it's not, I've never really seen anything like it. It, like, sets up a Groundhog Day rule scenario because nobody except you, re- except the main character, remembers what happened uh, the last, uh, Monday, except everything he does in those Mondays does affect things, it's just that no one can exactly remember it, and the timeline just sort of rewrites people's memories so they think something else happened. 
than what actually happened. Okay. Happened. So yeah, it's that still do, that does sound really cool. Yeah, it does, and uh, as it does a really cool thing and uh, like two chapters that are in a prison that really play with this cleverly. Yeah, it's uh, just it's way smarter than it should be for this type of game. Oh, and you can also get in a rap battle with two guys cosplaying as Jay and Silent Bob. Awesome. It's oh, and it, there, there's just so many references. It's fucking. It's it's a really good game, but I'd probably get it on sale. Yeah, that it's style, like twenty dollars. You're right about the art style. It doesn't make a good first impression. It yeah, looks like, it looks fucking awful. Someone looks really like trying to imitate Seth MacFarlane. It's like if Brickleberry and Family Guy had a gross, disgusting baby. Does it at least look better when it's animated, or...? Oh, yeah, it looks better when it's animated, just not in still shots, because it instantly reminds you of the worst things. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was interesting. I, I've, I've looked at Randall's, Randall's Monday for a while. I may end up getting it now. It sounds fun. All right, so what I've been reading... I've been reading a little two-volume series that I, I picked up in a bookstore a while back called Sickness Unto Death. Uh, it was written by Ta Takehiro Seguchi. No, wait a minute. God Gucci, damn it, Gucci, they had Gucci, it reversed. Gucci. No, that was the artist. The, the writer was Hikaru Asada. <laughs> Freaking. Freaking everything had it reversed. And Jonathan's back to shit posting, of course. Anyway, <laughs> what else is the new? Series, <laughs> we are the series is about a, a college freshman named Kazuma, who's going into psychology. He wants to be a therapist. And he ends up moving in with this girl, girl named uh, Emiru. And basically, Emiru is suffering from a severe case of depression. Uh, and no one has been able to help her. No one's been able to figure out what what brought this on. It, it came on very suddenly. No one understands it. But they do understand that it's affecting her health. That she's basically going to die soon if if she can't get past this, and so she basically turns to Kazuma to try and help help with this. So, I, I guess the first thing I can say is the artwork in this is very good. It is very gorgeous. Uh, wonderful backgrounds, nice character designs. Uh, as for the story, it t it takes. We talked about X Day before. We talked about X Day on a previous episode and how it did. It had a very real look at depression. This is sort of the opposite of that. Whereas it, it deals with it deals with depression, and I don't think it deals with it in a very bad way. But I, it, at the, at its best, you could call it theatric, theatrical. At its worst, you could call it just complete hamminess. Like. Like, through most of the first volume, the depression is just literally described as her falling into despair. Oh, And Christ. yes, I do have the back of the hand on the forehead. I, I, <laughs> it's funny it. It's funny you say it like that. I just finished watching a playthrough of Daigon Rampa. <laughs> so, nice. so this, much oh, don't, despair. Don't spoil it. I won't. Uh, it, but it's kind of funny because... It, like it, there's this whole mystery of her being depressed and just Kazuma trying to piece that together bit by bit and the first volume kind of hooked me hooked me a little bit it was the second volume that just completely just like was kind of I was lukewarm about the series like yeah man I like it man I don't to like okay yeah this is absolutely this is fantastic I want to keep going with this the second volume turns everything around, which is sad because I feel like a lot of people who are going to read this are going to read the first volume and be like, eh, I, I'm not a fan of this. I don't know. It's And I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it because I'd like you guys to read it. And I've even thought about bringing it on to rainy day reading. But it is it is an interesting little take on depression. If, if a bit... Eh, I, I guess ham-fisted is the best word, even though I think I've used that word already. So, yeah, that's what I've been reading. Probably the shortest time I ever I ever spent uh, talking about what I've been reading. 
but I had to make up for Jonathan taking up half our time. <laughs> so guys, are you, are you guys ready to talk about Nikigahara Holograph? As soon as, mean, as, as, soon as Jonathan's done sh as soon as Jonathan's done shit posting. I never will Ninja be. Lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> We're Italian now. Exactly. <laughs> the new rainy day aesthetic. Oh god damn it. Watch as a man other than his wife than our wife stick his manhood up her private parts. Oh god damn it. Well, well, come one come all So Don't yeah bully. <laughs> this manga was a bummer. <laughs> yeah, this yeah, I kind of, yeah. I'm kind of almost happy uh, Jonathan is shit posting because at least, at least that's kind of livening up the mood. Considering that when we really get into this, it's going to depress the hell out of us. Oh, uh, don't fun. worry, I'll be making a lot of our atheism jokes at this one. Oh, can I just? For God's sake! I'm kind of jumping the gun a bit. I was just like randomly opening the pages, and I stumbled across the one where um. The uh, glasses character, uh, da 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 da, uh, 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 the, uh, Suzuki. No, the glasses character. The yeah, guy with the suit doesn't matter. Well, whatever. There's like three I just stumbled. I just stumbled characters. across the one where he's in elementary school and he randomly kisses that girl who's like stalking him. And then, she, and then oh. out of nowhere, just punches her. <laughs> Bam! I'm like the fuck. Faced. I just randomly opened to it. I'm sorry, I had to say person. that. I had to say that. <laughs> I was like, uh, no, what? It, is a, it is a glorious moment. It, <laughs> it really is. is. <laughs> you know, for what is supposed to be a depressing look at horrible things happening to people, we seem to be laughing a lot. Yeah. I think it's because it's, it is generally funny when it actually pulls out jokes like that. Yeah. And, and it, it does it kinda... more often than you expect. Very it, true. Let, let me first describe the plot uh, to our listeners, and then they'll actually know uh, what we're talking about. Oh, you about. have to put plot in quotations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that big. is true. So, I don't mean that as an insult. I mean it like, I think that was deliberate choice just to make this as confusing as humanly yeah, possible. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Uh, it, the way this story is told has a very... I feel like you guys might call me out on this when I say this, but it has a very tree of life kind of feel to it. Like it jumps no around a lot. What There's that no. Is. I know what the You've movie You've never is seen the tree of life? Oh, you guys. Well, okay then. So, <laughs> uh, to describe them, what I'm describing for anyone who hasn't seen the tree of life, tree of life is very loose with its plot. Uh, it's very. Si uh, the the one difference I'd say between the two of these is uh, tree of life is very symbol symbolism heavy. But what they have in common is they have a, a flowing narrative. The, like, the story has a beginning, middle, and end. It's just kind of the beginning, middle, and end are rearranged to be put in various places. If like, there, nothing if, is... If there's a way to... Dis is, oh, if there's a way to compare it um, to both an anime series as well as a film, because they both do something... They both do the same thing. Um, anime series, Bakuno has done this. Film-wise, though, Memento has done this. Like they take everything well, out of the... was technically straightforward, just backwards. Yeah. The, well, it's the point so I'm trying inventive. to make, I'm trying to, the point I was trying to make though is that they kind yeah, of yeah. jumbled the story together. It's not in any kind of chronological yeah. order, but by the end, you kind of can slowly piece together yeah. that chronological order. Yeah, I see. What you mean. Yeah. But yeah, it's definitely not a straightforward story. No. So, so now that we've explained that, uh, shall I at least attempt to explain the plot? Yeah. And you guys can jump in and a fix me if I oh, oh, let, let me do, let me do, let me, do, let, me, do, let, me let me do this. Okay. <laughs> People are terrible, and that's why bad things happen. <laughs> Infinity. God is dumb. <laughs> as, as Jonathan was saying earlier, God is dumb. <laughs> Oh no, I don't. Yeah. That never comes up in it, but it has like a similar attitude to like a poster you see on art atheism. Like they just realize the world is really shitty, and that's as far as they got. It is like relentlessly depressing. <laughs> yeah, it's like every single bad thing you can imagine happening, except cancer and maybe an STD, happens in this fucking manga. Like, I kept thinking, maybe eventually, like, something good will happen. I don't think it ever did. It gets to the point where these don't feel like people, but grotesque 
uh, caricatures yeah. of people in a dark comedy, except it's not actually a comedy all the time. Mm. And when it's funny, it's the few times those characters actually f- kind of feel like people. So yeah. yeah, I don't think he was in a good headspace when he wrote this. Yeah. See, I, okay, I was saying this on Twitter, I said this in the sketch, I'm gonna say it now. Early Asano is very depressing, very dark, Oh no! and shit. it does not have the silver lining or any even semblance of hope that his later works will have. Yeah. And I really feel it was Solanine On where that started to come into play, and this one uh, is another work that is before Solanine, like City of Light beforehand. That was very similar. It was a very dark series. There really wasn't that great, uh, that silver lining, that feeling of hope in all the despair that kept you going. Yeah. It really was just kind of this very depressing dredge through the lives of these characters in this city. Uh, and we even described it then as kind of almost cartoonish how, how much these characters suffer. Yeah. And very much I see the same thing here. So it seems like early Asano was a very depressed, very sad person who really wanted to vent that out in his works. Yeah, I was kind of reminded of the characterization of all the not Christian characters and God's not dead for this like this entire series. They're just mm-hmm. cartoon stereotypes that are here to look bad because bad things exist. I mean, yeah, like Solonin Solonin was like kind of depressing, but there was always like this underlying, hey, but there can still be good. You yeah, can still Yeah, Solonin yeah. kind of it ended on kind of a bittersweet kind of on a bittersweet note. Like it did have these depressing moments and everything, but by the end like you were saying, there's this underlying underlying feeling of some kind of hope that there's that things are going to get better in this world and for these characters. Nijigahara holograph, I don't know what happened. <laughs> it was just bitter 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 bitter. bitter. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> Like, I remember the part where the kid uh, gets really mad because one kid told on uh, told the teachers that another kid was basically bullying him, which is the right fucking thing to do. But then yeah, he gets mad weird. about it because he saw him like as so cowardly, cute. and it, then it made that kid out to look like the bad guy after all because his mom is ugly and he's uh, scared and brags about it. Yeah, and then like the whole confrontation um, between these two kids and then the mom and the teacher step in, the mom's like, you you don't know how education is supposed to go. Who, who raised this child? Da, 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 da. And then, like, both the mother and I think the, the, the son who told on everyone was calling everyone else idiots. I'm like, what yeah. the hell? Well, that was the, that was the whole point of what the kid who was saying it was wrong for the kid to tell the teachers that he was being bullied. It was like, oh, you're just going to hide behind bigger people your whole life. You're not going to fight your own fight. Yeah. And then immediately he just hides behind his mother's back to basically call him nincompoop. (laughs) Yeah, basically, yes. And then he gets a broom and tries to murder him. Yeah. Yeah. He was unstable. It's just, I'm, I don't think we ever find out exactly what happens to that girl he ends up punching, but I think it's heavily implied well, it's not a good thing. Well, I think what ended up happening... She was the best character in the whole uh, let's not, I, I, The reason I'm not explaining the thing that was implied is because it's kind of spoilery, so let's not go there just yet. Okay. I, I, I think I know what happened to her, though, if I read this correctly. <laughs> I was speed reading this for an hour and a half before doing the podcast, so I'm some parts I may be confused with and I'm still trying to digest everything. Oh, don't worry, that's normal. <laughs> yeah. It sadly is. I, I like, schedule these a week in advance and there are times even I'm just like, oh crap, I have to record this in three hours. Yeah, I had a lot Read of stuff I needed to do. There was a lot yeah, of things I still needed to do. Up. I was actually reminded of another uh, psychological dark series called Homunculus, <laughs> which I love bringing up because it's fucked up. Well, of course, it was from the guy who made Itchy the Killer, so that's expected. It was a series about uh, basically a homeless man with a car who gets a who goes through an experiment. It can start when he covers one of his eyes. He sees people as things called homunculus or reflections of their real self, 
and it, but he's really seeing parts of his own self in these people and it just gets all metaphorically fucked up from there and this series has a lot of similarities in that it's basically about really screwed up people doing really terrible things yeah and it gets progressively darker, even if it looks like it might actually get kind of better. And ends on a really confusing ending that makes it very vague of what exactly happened. Except the ending here is much more pretentious. Which is amazing because Homunculus runs on Freudian psychology, which is just pretension 101 at this point. Right. Mm. Yeah, it's like here the uh, main running theme of the series becomes infinity. The idea that everything is just going to keep happening. That that not that you can't exactly escape uh, the end of things because that will just lead to the beginning of things, you know, the whole cycle of life. Except it does it in a very 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 vague way where it tells you exactly what it means but then characters just do weird things and weird stuff's happening mm. and it's heavily implied a thing is happening with the exact same character talking to himself or something and it's just like okay someone just saw like a uh, oh crap what's a someone just saw like a uh, some like a razor head or something and decided, you know what, I can be just as weird. Yeah. I kinda went off Yeah, Sounds I went off right. on a tangent. Yeah, like this is a very easy series to understand if you realize that real world logic doesn't apply at a certain point, but then the thematic logic just feels really contrived in how it's presented. If that makes any sense. Mm. Like, it well, I mean, it, like, it was. Just... I, I mean, here's the thing. I think early on, and this is gonna sound ridiculous. I almost think we were supposed to, like, we saw him even mention the, the. They're like, I think two real main characters, and that's Suzuki, who we meet while he's in elementary school, and he's the suicidal kid we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And then there's Komatsu, Komatsuzaki. Uh, who basically, who is a basically a bully growing up, and he ends up becoming a murderer as an adult. Yep. And I, I wasn't sure, but I think in the beginning we're supposed to suspect that these two characters were the same at first until they're revealed not to be. I think he was just not not really sure how to differentiate them in the art. But I kind of yeah. see what you mean there. I kind of see what you mean after I'm after I finished reading it, like, there's similarities between the two in that they're defined by isolation and hatred, but they kind of react to it different. Like, one becomes more numb and one becomes more outwardly aggressive. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess, yeah. but still. As long as we're on the topic of the art, I think that was probably the strongest aspect of it. it was oh, yeah. Absolutely! Oh, yeah. I love the panel work in this one. I just yeah. love the panel work. Like, a lot of manga artists don't really understand how you can tell a story with just pictures, but this series gets it so perfectly. Like, in that scene where you discover that one character is a serial killer, and uh, it's uh, transitioning and building up drama in the scene where he catches up to his potential victim, and what happens afterwards, and it's just all told so seamlessly perfect with no dialogue explaining it. And then, like, even Ace. some some of the details for some of the larger panels and stuff like that, because there was the ones like with the big group of butterflies and all that stuff, and then it kind of got a little bit unique and creative. Because there was one point I was still going through the manga, and then there was just this completely black page. I thought I'd actually reach the end, but I didn't. It was still going. It was part of it. I was like, "What in the world?" It it yeah. It knows it this it knows how to create the kind of tone and mood that it wants to go with in telling the story. And it's art wise, it's done beautifully, honestly. Just too bad it's yeah. really cynical and depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, I don't mind that cynical and depressing. I just. It's, 
it's hard for me to put my finger on it. It's just like the way it tries to explain it and make it seem like it's so perfect and right with it's like Catcher in the Rye gets criticized for doing a sort of similar thing, except the main character of that book suffered from post traumatic stress disorder and it makes it very clear at the beginning when he describes he saw his best friend dying mm. and so he has a reason for being such a detached, cynical asshole and you're not supposed to completely see things as he uh, gives them out. But that's not what I'm getting here because it tries to make every single character either as cartoonishly pathetic or evil as humanly possible. Yeah. There was really no character you were supposed to be able or at least I felt that you that a person could realistically put themselves in the shoes of could really understand. It's like these I are would just very I would depressed, very broken children that will grow up to be kind of horrible adults. Right. I will make exception for the teacher. Her chapter is like when the series started to pick up for me. Because with just one single panel of showing a bruise on one of her kids, it speaks just like thousands of words at just that one moment in her reaction afterwards as she yeah. was sitting on the steps. That was like the one human element in this entire series to me. The one truly human thing. If yeah. that makes sense. Because the rest of the time it's ridiculous. Like one that serial killer guy, like he get uh, asked to keep a picture of his this girl he's hitting on. This uh, picture she drew and she thinks he likes it, but then she he she leaves and he's still smiling and he just snaps the picture over wait, his wait, fucking wait. leg. Wait, wait, the serial killer. You're talking yeah, about... He, no, no, no. no the, there's two the serial, serial killers. killers. No, but yeah, when, when you say serial killer, no, I'm no. thinking of um, the, thinking. the other kid. I'm not he, thinking he of the cafe the serial killer, yeah. If you want to give, owner... give this guy a better title, there's a word for it. Um, no, I, I think serial killers... Working. No, I mean, I think... No, ser- I think perfectionist, because technically he never killed anyone. And it was he made his motives very clear. I think it's implied he killed a shit ton of people over the years. No, not that No, guy. no, I mean, like, he hits people with bricks, he okay, cuts them no, up. no, I am thinking of something, because he technically, he pretty much just outright says he burned his house down with, and I... Wait, was that him, died. or was that was that him, or was that someone doing the... No, no, uh, that was him that in was, the past. That, where... that was... No, no, the, I know... The character's who, name I is know Makoto, that, per- that helps. No, I'm not sure that's the same person as this guy, or just another character all entirely, because it's... It... The no, art no, no. In... It, it was. It's it the was, same one. Because when he's in the future, when we're, like, at the present day and not in the past, he talks about how this little girl, and then we go to him in the past, and it's the same guy who says he burned his house down. Yep. Okay, I was confused on that, because the art gets sort of same-facey with a few characters sometimes, so that kind of threw me off a little. But yeah, yeah that... that's part of the reason. It, I, that's part of the reason I co- I thought uh, the serial killer and Suzuki were the same person was because without the glasses, you really can't distinguish between them. Yeah, oh, I, I thought uh, that at first too. But then when they were like calling by their actual names, I was like, oh, okay, that's not yeah. this person. <laughs> I think the implication though is that uh, Scissors guy or Perfectionist or whatever you want to call him has killed a lot of people. Like it makes it clear he's a. He's a pedophile. He was in a relationship with a very young girl, and he sort of snapped somehow when uh, this girl saw him doing something terrible to another woman, the teacher. And I think uh, her being there is what stopped him from killing the teacher at that point. But I think the implication, especially what he was he was about to do to. Uh, this girl was that he's killed a lot of people over time and he's just been good at hiding in it, but he doesn't see it what he's doing necessarily as murder or something. I still don't think he really murdered a lot of people. Mainly just his family. I don't think... I wouldn't call him the serial killer of the series. I would would agree with the pedophilia and possibly if we want to throw... I hate to say this word. Rape into the mix... Then yes, but no, not no, serial he's a, he's killer. He's a rapist. Yeah, he's definitely a rapist. By the reason I say serial killer is because he ha- he's much more of a classic serial killer than anyone else in this mm. series. Like cold, calculating, very 
detached from the his uh, victims. Yeah, I guess that's true. He has because, his, uh, he's also has an abuser mentality where he doesn't really think that he's doing the wrong thing, and even when he does, his uh, is uh, his logic and trying to fix it makes no sense. Like, he, he kind of reminds me of what I think the Zodiac Killer would have really been like. Ted Cruz. That's what no, you mean, Ted I, Cruz. <laughs> yeah, and, and like what, he's like what you would expect to see from a serial killer in like a, in like a crime drama show or something. Mm. But, um, the, why the other guy is just in a very different headspace, and it's sort of implied he's like under some sort of influence or mystical influence or something. Mm. I, I, I don't know if I... I arguing semantics. Yeah, but I, like, I don't know if I still agree with that. I mean, like, <clears throat> the funny thing is, too, it's like the series gives themselves kind of a good out for, like, oh, so you can say it was, like, mental trauma. But the thing is, he still acts like this before he gets that mental trauma. So it's like, he's just kind of always, like, in loft or just... He just mentally is just... No, that's not right. Not mentally. Just emotionally, he's so detached that he just can't see killing people as something bad, it seems like. Mm. Yeah, I think he... I think... Uh, wait, which one are we talking about now? <laughs> we're, we're talking about Komatsu Ka- Kaki. He's the guy who killed the rapist. Okay, because uh, I was going to say... Uh, I was going to say the other guy has, like, the signs of being a genuine sociopath. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. I mean, you can kind of trace a lot of his behavior back to... Back to two points, I would say. One being the girl hospitalized, because he's... he. We find out that this guy has had, like, the biggest crush on this girl since they were kids... And then the uh, a girl that the entire class worked together to throw down a well. Mm-hmm. Good times. And then speaking of that well, actually, I would say the second incident that definitely causes a lot of change in him is when that moment where he uh, he's starting to beat up this kid that they're bullying, but then one of his buddies is like, "Okay, you need to stop now." Gets into a fight with him, and. He gets back Knocked upside the head and thrown down the hole. Basically, the same, the, almost the same fate that this girl who's hospitalized ends up going through. So he's gone through a lot, and the men- his mentality, his mentality has probably changed a lot. Like not just from this girl being hospitalized that he loved so much, but for being hit in the head by a concrete slab and then being tossed down a fucking well for everybody to just forget about until he just magically appears again. So, if you're not, if your brain, if your mind, or if you, if you mentally aren't, like, still all there after some things like that, <laughs> it kind of plays an, it plays an impact on you later on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, everyone in it has issues. Yeah. Yeah, basically, I mean... <clears throat> I'm sorry, got a in my throat. Basically, I, I really don't know what else to say because we basically, I mean, I guess really the last big thing we could ask is what was the big connection between the two main characters? Because throughout the whole story, I mean, there are off chapters here and there that focus on other things. The two main characters of the series are the serial killer, Komatsu Zaki, and Suzuki, the depressed kid, and we we really haven't even touched on Suzuki because throughout the series he just kind of acts well he's he's depressed clearly but mm-hmm. he just kind of acts very passively it doesn't feel like there's any big change to his character uh, until even... the until the scene where he tries to kill that kid with the broom yeah no even then I even think then, I, would, I don't know. I would think the bigger change would come when he returns back to this place like several years later. I think that's more when the bigger change for him comes okay. through. Okay, I, I'm going to say this right now. I did not get that in the slightest, and I've thought about it for, like, hours after I finished reading, and I'm like, what in the world happened in that last chapter? I have a few ideas That's a on good that. question. <laughs> mm. 
I have a few ideas on that. First, though, I would like to uh, get some ideas on what you guys think the butterflies are meant to represent. Because that's a symbol that keeps popping up, and it definitely has meaning. Mm. I think butterflies are supposed to be, like, connected to ideas of death and rebirth in some myths, but I'm not entirely sure. Well, you could also argue that butterflies are meant to represent change because of the whole process a butterfly is born, and with the sheer number of them mm -hmm. for the series. But I don't know if that counts, because it doesn't seem like anyone changed <laughs> as they grew up. Just, but then again, you could oh, argue... Oh, no, no. The, well, that's maybe... Our, Huh? A lot of the characters did change, just not for the better. For the worse, yeah. I, I, and when the I kind of, my thought on if we're talking symbolism that the butterflies would represent, I would think like as an escape, because a lot of times when because there are a few moments where some of the characters are basically I don't know the best way to describe it, like devoured by these butterflies. I guess is the best way to describe it. A lot of times they're trying to escape their world and the reality that's currently there for them. Mm. So I, I sort of interesting way of looking at it. Cause like so I kind of feel like even though these butterflies in one context are supposed to symbolize and be part of the supposed end of the world, some of the characters will end up devoured by these butterflies. Like the teacher, um, like the glasses guy, like a few others. They're trying to I, also escape the world they're in right now after everything that's happened. Yeah, I saw. I think that's so the best fun. answer so far. But I saw. I'm sorry. The, oh, sorry. I, I personally saw them a bit more as a force of judgment. Like, they're basically, they sort of play the same role that like the four horsemen would in the apocalypse. They uh find uh, the various people out in the world and they uh take the ones that's have some guilt of a sin they've committed, like... Like, the main character for... No, crap, which main character? The depressed kid, for example, when he comes back to town, he has this really freaky uh, memory where he remembers or that he... Well, maybe he remembers or maybe this girl came up and he finally got to meet her and he ends up killing her. And this... Like, he's been terribly now, depressed. Now, did that happen, or didn't that That's happen? Hang on, yeah, hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm not done yet. Okay, I'm sorry. Like, by this logic, the butterfly should have come at him when he was a kid originally, because he absolutely wanted an escape at that point. Like, he tried to commit suicide, like, what, two, three times? Yeah. But they never appear, so when they appear later on after he's uh, killed and he's... Uh, or at least he thinks he's killed this girl and he feels incredible guilt for it, that's when he's taken. The butterflies always seem to swarm around whenever people feel guilt for something they've done, which is why they don't appear when the girl and that uh, serial killer guy are uh, in the last chapter hanging out in her room because she doesn't feel guilt of what she's done. She feels like she's finally getting something good that she deserves she never got before. Like, she's... And she's also though, implied that she's kind of emotionally detached. So she's sort of turning into the same person as her former abuser. You know, Mr. Scissors. Mm. Like, it's always the characters who feel guilt or incredible sadness over something they've done or failed to do. Including the teacher. Like, she's definitely not a sinner, but she feels... Uh, she feels she's not done what she's supposed to do as a teacher and as a mother. And so it finally, the butterflies end up taking her for it. Yeah, you that's see, definitely the best. That's the best answer I think we could have come up with. Yeah. That's yeah, like the butterflies are. They're butterfly. Yeah. But that's the thing. The butterflies aren't just judgment. They're death and rebirth because the theme of affinity kicks up in the last chapter, where it implies that all these events. And all this suffering is just going to keep repeating in an endless cycle in different ways. And the, the butterflies are just the force that carries that out. And I think it's implied they're sort of coming to existence because of all this... The myth that's originally made about the monster and all these kids believing in it so much that the myth starts to become real. Yeah, I still also think going along those lines, uh, the butterflies, to the characters themselves, are still also that form of escape. Like, they they are guilty in some respects of some of the things that they've done. 
So when they see these butterflies, they willingly are okay with them taking them away so they can get out of this world. I still, th I think it's a, I think the symbolism is a lot of different factors. Like the death and rebirth, um, judgment for guilty, uh, sins and things like that. And also for some characters, it's an escape. It's their way of getting out. That makes sense to me because one of the characters who's not taken by the butterflies and rejects them is, the, of course, that girl who... Right, exactly. Yeah, just becomes an abuser and makes that her reason to live. So, like, she finds a reason to live, it's just a terrible reason. Mm. So, yeah, it's sort of like a mix of all that. Yeah. And, of course, uh, our uh, good serial killer friend doesn't end up getting taken because he just literally can't remember anything properly. Yeah. And it's... And that's just become a problem again, and he can't escape it. Yeah, so be he's never going to end up feeling guilt or a reason mm -hmm. to leave. Be yeah, because of some of the trauma he's gone through, of course his memory's going to be all screwed up. So he, because he his memory's screwed up, he wouldn't remember what, what he'd feel guilty for, so he has no chance of getting out of this endless cycle. And then of course there's that last page, which is just a what the fuck. Well, the last few yeah, pages. We oh. Yeah, but I think on, I kind of understand the what they're going for. You mean? That. Yeah, I think I understand where they're going with that, but I also don't with this with the shared name thing. Yeah. Now, now here's my thing about the hospital scene. I mean, I I guess really even asking the question is kind of spoiling it, but. I was very confused by that because it seemed like it was happening in present day, but also past, and I just didn't get it at all. Oh, okay. Now I'm. Now that you mentioned that, makes perfect sense with the theme of affinity. It's trying to say that all these, that like this world is basically a gigantic time loop hell for these, for these people. Like I don't think. Oh this my is, god. Oh, oh my god, Mikikahara Holograph is a giant Groundhog Day fanfic. Oh my no, god. No, no, it's more, it's more like Lost. Oh, good lord. It's oh, more like what people... Worse. No, it's more like what people thought Lost was going to be when it was uh, like some sort of purgatory, except that only ended up being what the side timeline was. And like, the island was something even more ridiculous than that. Yeah, it's definitely... I think definitely the ending shows that this is an endless and infinite loop. That the cycle, there's no real way to break the cycle. It's just going to keep going forever and ever. Whether or not it's for the same characters, not not necessarily. It could be for entirely different people. This, there's someone out there. Their the cycle keeps continuing and it just keeps going from person to person throughout the whole. You know what the thing. worst part is. Of all this, what it it kind of does speak for real life, doesn't it? Mm. Like more so than almost the stories with the silver lying and hope. Because I was oh. reading this, I was reading this immediately after finishing reading this. I went onto Twitter and started reading up on all of the Allison rep posts, and I'm like, so basically, what happened two years ago with Zoe Quinn is happening again today. And that's exactly what this series tries to cover, in that all these terrible things have no end. So really, this is perhaps this might have the most parallels to real life. Oh, uh, let in let me let me step in here real quick. Okay, first of clarification: this shit has been going on every fucking week for the past two years. But in but in relation to the series, it is not a good reflection of life. Because those silver linings are actually a very important part of how people can get through such a all these crappy, crappy, terrible situations and I, mm -hmm. and times. I'd agree with that. The yeah. reason this series doesn't resonate with me, even though I do respect a lot of what it does, is because it's just so endlessly, endlessly cynical in such a childish way. And, like, it feels very detached and inhuman because of it. It's like some 12-year-old, uh, made a bad, uh, made a, f who was, like, a really good writer, but still had, like, no maturity, 
made a story where everyone is terrible and awful because that's how he saw the world, even though he's only 12 and doesn't really understand true suffering or pain yet. Like, the best stories about pain and suffering I know, like, for example, Actual Sunlight, this very beautiful, very dark game made by uh, this man who was recounting his uh, battle not only with depression, but at a time he almost attempted suicide. It is a very, very dark and grim game, but it has all these moments of beauty and... uh, and it really captures all these complex, interesting emotions. It paints a picture of an actual human being, several human beings, in fact, and by the end of it, there's a real sense of tragedy. But I don't get that from this series because everyone is just so constantly terrible for the dumbest reasons. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Sounds like right. uh, the teacher, like the teacher marrying an abusive husband because he was like her prince in... Uh, Shining armor is the most cliched bullshit. Yeah, like, like it's almost cartoonishly cynical to the part point is kind of hard to relate with because there's no because life does have silver lining sometimes. And since there's none, it's just like it's weird when the abusive boyfriend guy who's like implied to be a serial killer and murdered his entire family is somehow the most real li- is one of the more realistic characters of the cast because. He's actually kind of close to how actual sociopathic serial killers end up being. But I can't say that for anyone else, and that is such an opposite situation for me for these types of things. Mm. Alright, guys. Uh, Well, we've been going for over an hour now, so uh, do you guys feel like it's time to start wrapping up our final thoughts? Yeah, I got got stuff to do in the morning. (laughs) I I have to be an adult. (laughs) Yeah, I'm an adult. adult. I had a part we, we of the can't... system. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave, Everyone's a phony. Oh, Jesus. Okay. What are your God doesn't even do anything. Hey, my dad's going to give me back my Xbox because I got good grades. You want to come over? Oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Niji, whatever, holograph has... It, it has a lot of good stuff going for it. It's interesting. I like. I kind of like how it uses a non-chronological narrative, and the the art is beautiful and the paneling is great. But it's so like re- relentlessly, almost cartoonishly depressing that it's kind of hard to relate to it on any level, and it just kind of makes you feel bad because <laughs> everyone in it is bad and everything that happens to everyone is bad. But it was like, interesting to read. And I'm glad I read it. So I give it like a like a six out of ten. If I if this uh, manga had ever come from like some sort of Western mindset, there'd be a heavy religious theme, and there would be at least one character walking around just yelling, "God's not real." <laughs> <laughs> this came from a Western mindset. It would be Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. No, let's not compare this to Batman vs. Superman, Don and Oh, Justice. God damn it! <laughs> yeah, that was a lot more pretentious. Oh, yeah, and plus it was objectivist and uh, ultimately morally disgusting and didn't have any sense of e- uh, empathy for the human race and felt like it was written by a robot that believes only in the most basic ideals of capitalism. You see where I'm going with this. I do. Jonathan, what are your final thoughts <laughs> on uh, Niki Gahara? This was an this is a very interesting series. Like, I definitely don't hate it because I admire a lot of the craft to it and a lot of the artistic choices, the big ideas and themes it plays with. But where it falls apart is that it lacks a proper understanding of what human is. And it doesn't, and it's trying to take itself very seriously. And, like, it's trying to say something profound, but all these characters are just so ridiculously terrible to almost degrees of what would be parody or black comedy that the only parts that I feel truly perfectly work are the comedy bits because they're, it's actually the only time it feels like there's humanity in the writing. But those are few and far between because we're always focused on terrible things happening and all these fucked up implications about characters and it just never really adds up properly it's like it's like if uh, 
the kid from Catching the Rye wrote a book, and not yeah, and not you were reading about his adventures in a book because then you have because then you're aware he's not a reliable narrator. If that makes sense, I'm yeah, yeah. rambling. Okay, yeah. <laughs> right. I give I uh, give it like uh, f- five out of ten. Okay, Stephanie. Uh, well, I'm still trying to digest it after speed reading it, but um, for for what this is for Nijika Holograph. The art style and everything in the structure of it looks amazing. It's the content and the story itself that can kind of, that can leave rather mixed feelings um, for people, because because um, what's the best way to put this? It's very jarring, and there are some things in here that seem really odd and hard to understand um, for some people. Some of it, like some of the things that the characters go through can be relatable. It's just how the way that it's handled it just seemed really odd to me. But I can appreciate what it was doing and considering I Solonin was the first work I've read from Asano. I can appreciate this different side of what was what his work was, but it could still there's a lot more to it and I feel like if I didn't have to like speed read it in like an hour and a half, two hours for the podcast, and I had the chance to take my time with it, I might be able to pick up more things a lot easier and maybe be able to digest it a bit more. Um, so for what it is, I do think it's good. There's a lot more to it that I would love to try and figure out and dive into, but because it wants, because I do want to dive into it again, at the very least at some point in time, I'm, it, it gives, it piques my interest then at least, so I'm gonna have to give it, I'm gonna have to give it a 6 out of 10. It may seem jarring and confusing a bit, but it's still... At least for a first read for me, it has me wanting to reread it later on and try and delve into a bit more when I don't have to like rush through everything. So I can so if if it managed to do that, then I have to give it some props for that. But otherwise than that, it looks beautiful. It's just the story and the content just seems a little bit bitter. A little too bitter <laughs> at times, so yeah. This this was a very dark and depressing series. I think we can all agree on oh, that. Absolutely. I do think the artwork and paneling was beautiful in this series. Score. Uh, huh? Score. Score? Oh, what score am I giving this? Score for the blood god. Oh, god damn. Stephanie's score. score. I, I gave my score six. Oh, she gave the score. Oh. I said six out yeah, of ten. Yeah, you not paying okay. attention. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised you, were, you weren't you were shitposting while I was saying that, or else I would say stop <laughs> shitposting Don't and pay Don't remind him! <laughs> we're almost done anyway. <laughs> He doesn't have time to shit post. Yeah, it was a very dark series. I felt like... But the problem is... So this was a character drama that I feel like the biggest problem was you couldn't relate to very many of the characters. And the ones you could relate to were not the main focus. So they'd show up for a little bit. You get to experience them. But then we go back to these other characters that you just cannot put yourselves in the feet of. You can't... Uh, bring yourselves to understand fully there it's and that's not say bad it just makes it it just makes it harder you need to present something that we want to watch instead of something we want to feel or understand in that case and that's something i don't think this series does so i think i'm gonna have to give this one a five out of ten just because like everything else except the character writing i think it does really well I think we've scored a titty shows higher than this manga. We absolutely have, but that let's but let's bad. face it, uh, that's because we have a titty show audio, titty show cast for a titty show uh, score. <laughs> I hope I was never there when that happened. Oh, I'm sure you were. Oh. So uh, this is a two fives, two sixes. That'd be a five point five out of ten, guys. Not bad. Yeah, right. uh, uh, not good either. Score this, 
Oh, I'm pretty sure we scored this higher than Ibitsu at least, so... Crap, I can't remember what Ibitsu... Wait, was that the one with the Lolita? Yeah. I'm scared of the Lolita. I was like, I wouldn't know. I wasn't around for that one. <laughs> I apparently wasn't there for that one. Yeah, I oh, wasn't there either. Oh, you guys missed some fun stuff. That was with Lamar the Frog and Danny, and that was spectacular. Oh, really? Hang on, I think I still have screen caps <laughs> from that. You didn't manga. know that we had Lamar the Frog on for an episode? Somehow it was the best. That. He said, bad. I'm in there a lot. I've never even hear his voice. I, I, I've okay, never let's There's see. a whole episode where you can hear his voice. I got, you see what I have to deal with, folks? Can I, get, yeah. can I go to bed now? No. <laughs> yeah, can't. we're done. I want to go to bed. I got to go to work. But before we go to bed, before we go to bed, More shit let's see if, yes, Jonathan did post stuff that we can read so let us end it on give it up for Mr. Cock oh god mm. damn it <laughs> better send off <laughs> good night everyone good night Stephanie good night everybody I'm going to bed good night sleep is important it very yes <laughs> dream, dream dark and depressing dreams let's not let's not well butterflies but not dark and depressing dreams <laughs> check your window for Ted Cruz he may be waiting outside for you to go to sleep god damn it all right, one more before we end recording. My glasses are going to get pregnant! <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs>